Okay, we're going to move on to our next session now, which is going to be led by Kat Martin, who has been working in HD for over 25 years and has been with HDYO for the last 10 years, I mean, from the start, really. Yeah. So um, Kat's going to talk through some um, toolboxes today to cope with changes with HD. So, yeah. Thanks, Abby. Hello, everybody. They've given me a mic which anybody in the room that knows me is never a good idea. <laughs> so we'll start with share and we'll lead up. No, I'm only kidding. Right, so we're going to be talking about building your toolbox. So this is just based on me. So we'll go through this presentation. I'll use that term very loosely, uh, really quickly. And then you're going to become part of this because I was told it's a discussion. First off, who cannot understand me? <laughs> you are going to get more out of this session than anybody else. Hello, I was meant to click that earlier. So for those that don't know me, I'm Kat Martin. So um, as Abby said, I've been working in HD for just over 25 years, um, but I grew up in an HD family, so there is never been a point in my life that a member of my family has not been symptomatic with HD. So I have never known a life where somebody that I love does not have HD, ever. And I'm really old. Not as old as Alistair, but I'm really old. <laughs> Alistair's over there. <laughs> um, but my one thing that I'll tell you is, living in a family with HD, has given me more than it has ever taken from me. I have had so many amazing, positive, life-affirming experiences and met some of the most amazing people, some of whom are in this room, because of HD. And I want that to really sink in with you because it's really, really important. It's a big part of your toolbox, is that if you look for the good, and you look for the positive, you will find it. If you keep focusing on the negative, you'll also find that. So, building your toolbox. It's up to you what you put in it. But I'm gonna give you six things that I think you should put in your toolbox that will help you cope with the good, the bad, and the ugly of HD. Advocacy. Who knows what advocacy is? Nobody. Holy rubbish. Thank goodness you know, Grant. This is your job. <laughs> so advocacy is about either speaking up for yourself or having someone else speak up for you. So if you're an advocate, you are speaking up for someone else. If you are speaking up for yourself, you are advocating. And that's all it means is just to speak up. And there's two ways that you can advocate for yourself. And the first thing is the hardest thing to do. Ask for help. And know what that help looks like. So self-advocacy. How do, how do I need help? How does it look? How does it feel to ask for it? All of them are not easy answers and not easy questions. But these are the things that I would ask you to reflect on. Advocating for someone that you love or someone that you know is a little bit easier because you can take a step back from it. But it's still difficult. It's still difficult to find out who you need to speak to and most important, what language you need to know. I learned very young to use the language of the people I was talking to. So you're all in Glasgow, so you're all getting Glaswegian cat. Um, but when I was talking to doctors and nurses and clinicians, I mirrored their language. So if they would say something about, oh, they're being this. Yes, that's correct. This is how they're doing that. And it got to the point where my family made fun of me because I kept talking like the doctors. But the difference was the care my mum got was very different because of that. So learn their language is a really good tool for self-advocacy and for advocating for others. Also, it's really important that when you choose the people that you want to advocate for you, make sure they're right. 
So there are lots of people at this Congress that can help you with advocacy. And just because an advocate doesn't exist in your country or your community, doesn't mean that there isn't somebody out there that'll help you. So check out all the resources from all over the world because there's somebody somewhere that will help you, I promise you that. Especially if you're going through the HDO links, there's somebody that will help you. So advocacy, the first in the toolbox. I need Seth up here as my wee PA. Right, peers. This is the best, 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 best group you'll ever have. You've got two groups of peers. You've got the people that you grew up with, the people who are your friends, the people that are part of your extended family, the people that you met at work, the people that you met at college. They're your peer group. These are the people who will never know what you're going through when it comes to HD. They'll never know. And that's okay. And it's really, really important to have them because they're the people who are going to get you out your head when HD is on a cycle of, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, panic, panic, panic. They're your people for that. And it's okay that they don't understand HD. And it's okay that they don't know what you're going through. It doesn't mean that they can't help you, they absolutely can, but it's okay that they don't understand. Your other peer group is everybody you'll meet here your HD peer group, and they're the ones who will understand what it is to live with HD, whether that's living at risk, living positive, being negative, being a caregiver, being a sibling, whatever, this is your peer group for that. It is so crucial to coping with the bad side of HD to build that peer group, and they can again be from anywhere but I'll guarantee you, if you speak to people you've never met at this Congress, you will connect with them. There will be something in common that you have that will connect you. Anybody, randomly pick somebody and you'll find something in common. That's your HD peer group. Your HD peer group will help you through when things are really, really bad. The nice bit as well is that you can also help someone else and you can turn their bad into a good. You can also share your good bits as well. Do you know what was really cool? I took my mum white water rafting. My mum was in a wheelchair. It was hilarious trying to squeeze her into a wetsuit. It was even more fun trying to transfer her onto a rubber dinghy. It was even more fun trying to stop her getting out of the boat when she really wanted to, but you were in the middle of a river. Really good fun, stressful as anything. Telling my friends that, they were like, you took my white water rafting, yeah. Tell the HD community, they were like, how did you keep it in the boat? Velcro. Velcro. So, peer groups, have a good peer group. This, positive attitude. I said at the very beginning, you look for the positive, you'll find it. If you look for the negative, you'll find that too. A positive attitude about anything and everything does not mean you've got to be happy all the time. But it means when something bad happens, there'll be something good in it as well. It's the yin and yang thing. There is always something good. You might not be able to see it there and then because it's so sore and it's so horrible. But at some point in time, you'll look back and go, oh my goodness, that was good. There was this tiny little thing that was good about that. So for me, the biggest thing that happened to me was when my mum died, I had to go and tell my dad that his, the love of his life had passed away. So I'd gone into the house and my dad let out this horrible, heartbreaking noise. But when he composed himself a few minutes later, he said, she lived a good life. There was nothing more that we could have done and she had an amazing time. So even as his heart is breaking, he was still able to say, we did good and she did good. That's the positive in that. So he was still allowed to feel broken, but he looked for the positive and the positive was, we did good. 
So that's what I mean by find your positive attitude. Find what's good about everything in your life. Even the crap stuff will have something really, really good in it. And it will honestly change how you look at things. It will change how you face HD. It will change how you face the world. And it will open up and it will offer opportunities. Emily is an amazing person. Emily's down here in the front row and she's promised she won't heckle me. Don't believe her. Emily is the most positive person I've ever met. She is always smiling. Maureen and mum might disagree, but she is. She's always smiling and she looks at the world through this attitude. So if you get a chance, go speak to Emily and she'll tell you loads of lovely stories. Hands up who's got love in their life. How good is it to be able to turn around and say, I feel love? Every single person here feels love because at these congresses, at anything HDEO does, it is centered around that. It is centered around our love for another human being and making sure that those connections are there, making sure that everybody feels that they're important, that they're worthy, and that they deserve and belong here. And they do. And that comes from us having love in our life. And not the Hollywood romantic love I'm talking about. I just mean love. Love for another person as a human being. Because you deserve love and connection. Build those. Build that. Education. Know what you're talking about. If you don't know, go find out. Look up the websites, make sure they're reputable, but go find out, ask somebody. I'm not great at reading websites, and it takes lots of time to read things, doesn't it? So I phone people, and I have a conversation, or I turn up at a conference, or I get in touch with somebody, I use an advocate, or what have you, and pick their brains. I need to talk something through with you. Let me talk it through. What do you know about this? I don't really like that. Who am I going to phone to change it? I'm not allowed to talk to pharma because I don't like some of the stuff they do. I love the fact they're coming up with drugs and treatments and stuff. But there's some things I don't like. Now, when I say I'm not allowed to talk to them, they would prefer I don't talk to them. Doesn't stop me. But education is so, so important. And the whole reason HDO was formed was because young people couldn't get access to this for the longest time. In 2008, we spoke at an HD World Congress and were told that speaking to young people about HD and educating young people about HD was morally wrong. 2008. So in the short term, from 2008 to today, where we are at a co World Congress for young adults, we're now promoting this as the best thing. It took us four years to change their mind. We changed their mind in just four years, and that was through the creation of HDO and HD Buzz. Education was vital regardless of age. So it's really, really vital for you guys. And it's vital that you fight for education. If there is something that you do not know and there is nowhere to get it, fight for it. Build your advocates, build your army, change the world. Young people have done it. Young people in this room, young people at this Congress, change the world from 2008 to 2012. We changed the world for HD because they told them it was morally wrong to educate young people. So we built a website, we built a community, and we changed it. Your support network. Who's got a support network? Who's got a bigger support network because they're in Glasgow? <laughs> That's the important thing. Go talk to people, build that support network. And remember, your support network is not always HD related. Your support network is sometimes it's somebody to go for a coffee with. Or if you're over the age of consent, then you can go for a drink. But you can, it's just somebody you can say, I need 
to go out. I need to go and do something. I need to let off some steam. Or I need you to come over, get under a blanket, and we're going to cry over crisps together for the Americans in the room chips. Um, it's just something that you've got somebody that you can lean on for different things and in different ways. My, my form of support is that me and my best friend, regardless of how little we have in our bank account, find a flight to go somewhere when things get tough. So that's what we do. And we'll go, oh, there's a flight for £20 to... No idea how to pronounce that. Yeah, let's go. What are we going to do when we get there? Probably panic. But we've got a tent. We'll survive. But that's, that's just how we do things. But you find, as you get older, what's the best way to get your support? And mine's is by doing really stupid things. So support. So the six things in your toolbox are apples. Advocacy, positive attitude, peers, love, education, and support. Who did a Gwen? Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my take on this did not bad Abby I'm, I'm out of time already oh thank goodness so now I want you to tell me what else we add to our toolbox I got a fright there because I was like oh my god have I talked too much this is meant to be a discussion so you tell me what do you think's missing from this toolbox or what would you put in I'm going to point to this lot if you don't oh Maureen go for it a sense of humour, oh, so important. So, um, for those not from Scotland, this, as Scottish people, we have a very dark and sarcastic sense of humour, and it's not uh, understood sometimes. <laughs> like finding things really funny that are really not funny. See, I'm really, you all get it because you've probably spoke to somebody Scottish recently and you've gone, really? Oh my goodness. You're joking about that? We, we can also say something that is, a, is meant as a sense of humour, but we say it with such a straight face and so seriously that you need to take a wee breath and go, and then you get it. So yeah, a sense of humour is really important. Being able to laugh when things are going so wrong that it's just unbelievable. So another story about my, thank goodness my poor mother's dead because I tell so many bad stories about her. But um, mum was, was in respite and uh, I got a phone call, you need to come down, your mum's really agitated, we can't calm her down, she, she just keeps pointing at your phone number. Okay, I'm on my way. So I get down there and mum's sitting and I'm like, oh, she's got the face. You all right? What do you need? And she points to the bathroom. Okay, we'll go to the bathroom. Mum proceeds to kind of like empty her body of everything that she's ever eaten in her whole entire life. And I look at her and go, did you hold on to this for me instead of the room full of nurses and nursing assistants and everybody that can help take care of this? And she did this. Thanks, Mum. Thanks for this lovely, tender moment. But we both had a such stupid laugh about the fact that that's what my mum wanted. And that I'm now the person who has come down in clothes ready to go to work and trying to shower mum in the shower in my clothes. And she just thought this was the funniest thing ever. And it was just what could have been a really horrible time ended up one of the funniest memories I have with my mum because we were just shits and giggles. <laughs> He's getting banned. Okay, what else? Time. Time. Oh, golly. Wouldn't it be great if we could press pause on life like a live recording thing and just kind of go, yeah, this is the moment I want to extend for days and days and days and days and days because it's so good. We're a bit lucky in HD, I know you're going to go, where is she going with this? But trust me, we get a time limit with our people. We kind of know what that time limit is. So if we do that positive attitude and spin it, we know how long we've got to make really cool memories and really good memories and, and 
live in the moment. It teaches us that time is not infinite and that we've got so little of it. So little of it when someone's well enough to do things or that five minutes in the day where you know I'm going to get to the toilet and I'm not going to get disturbed and I'm going to be able to go in there even if it's just to be able to lock a door between us. And I might only get two minutes today, but it's two minutes more than I got yesterday. So time is really important. And that goes back to who's your support group? Where do you ask for help? Do you know what my help is? I need you to come and distract them so I can go for a poo. That's the kind of thing you need. That's okay. My friends tell me I overshare about the toilet but that's because I spent so long not getting to go when I needed to go. So now I need to ask permission to go to the toilet still. And you go to the toilet, it's the number one. And off I go. It's just how life works now, but time's really important. It's really, really precious. But in HD, we, we know that clock starts and we know we can start building things. So go and do stuff, go and life will, there will always be time to tidy your house. There will always be time to do the dishes. There will always be time to do the laundry. Always. There will kind of, there's a time limit on paying the bills apparently. But go live. Go have fun. Go have experiences because there is a time limit. With HD, we know what that time limit is. So you know where you need to go and you need to spend your time. So spend it wisely. Dina. Of course she has. <laughs> yeah. So they kind of go together, don't they? So self-care is about giving yourself a break in both the physical and the literal sense. I can put this down, I don't need it. Um, that whole thing about going to the toilet, having time to go to the toilet, is part of self-care. I need to go to the toilet for my own health. But also, it's that being able to lock yourself in a room and just kind of go, right, okay, let's plan out the next five hours of crazy. That time out, that, that just taking time to care for yourself and, and how you care for yourself is very, very personal. It's, it's what you need. So somebody like me is, where can I book a flight to? You know, I'm not very good at saving the planet. But... That's my self-care is to, I need to travel, I want to go and see things and then I can come back fresh. Usually exhausted, but fresh. Whatever your self-care looks like, learn it early. Learn how you want to care for yourself. And that could be alone time, it could be I need social time, it could be I want to read a book, it could be I want to watch a film, it could be I want to have a bitch session over mimosas. Pick what it is. Make sure it's healthy, but, you know, to a degree. Orange juice is in mimosas, therefore it's healthy in my head. Um, pick your self-care, and, and it, it changes over time as well. So what you want as a 20-year-old may be very different to what you want as a 40-year-old. Trust me. As a 40-year-old, I want to sit in a chair that's comfortable for five hours rather at a conference rather than these things that kill my back and hurt my bum and make me numb, it's no fun. So self-care. <laughs> the acceptance part of life, it, the longer you fight against acceptance, the harder it's going to be to accept something. But we, when we, when we did HDO camps and when we did camps in general, and I'm sure Grant, you'll know about this as well, we talk about the stages of grieving and the last one is always acceptance, whether you use the seven or the five stages of grieving, the last one is acceptance. And it's a process that everybody runs away from. They go, no, I am sitting in denial. It is wonderful here. And I'm going to stay here because the sun always shines in denial. It will catch up with you. Um, has anybody ever heard of the book, The Body Keeps Score? So the Body Keeps Score is a really cool self-help book, but it explains an awful lot. 
But part of that is about not accepting things and not dealing with things that come up and then it actually comes out physically in your body. So there's lots of science that goes to talk about trauma and its effect on people's physical body and why we have so much autoimmune disease and things. Acceptance is part of that. But you need to work through the process. You don't go from A to acceptance. You need to go from A through Z and back to acceptance. But trust the process. And the process is yours. It's your body. It's your mind. Follow. If you listen to your body, if you listen to your head, take that five minutes in the toilet to listen to what your body's telling you you will get to acceptance. And when you get to acceptance, you don't get to stay there because things change and you'll go back and forth and back and forth and it becomes a little journey for you. But staying on that path and staying listening to your own self will keep you nearer to acceptance than it will in denial because it might look like a really nice place, but it's shit. Don't go there. That was, can you shut her up? <laughs> That's all right. I don't mind being heckled. <laughs> Anybody else got something for the toolbox? Oh, fuck. Yes, Grant. Oh, who are we forgiven? Yes! Yes. Who's ever felt guilty about something that they've said to somebody they love? And uh, have you forgiven yourself for that? No, excellent. One, one person who speaks the truth. How much do you beat yourself up about it, even if it's like 20 years later? Every single day. Okay. Well, yeah. What a waste of energy it is. But it's so true that we do. We hang on to it. And, and you're doing something random, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, my God, you remember that time I said? It's... It is so important to forgive yourself and forgive others for how they do things. Um, like the people who come in to help and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to kill them in a minute. But just forgive them, just let it go. Self-forgiveness and forgiving others is really difficult. It's really hard to let go. But it goes back to that thing we were talking about with acceptance. Part of acceptance is forgiving others. Not everybody knows you. Not everybody knows your person, and not everybody knows what you need. Because you don't tell them. And if you don't tell them, they can't read your mind. So you need to learn to tell them what it is. And if you learn to tell them what it is, what you need, you're more likely to be able to forgive them and stop feeling so guilty about something. But we should all feel comfortable in being able to set our own boundaries and be okay with saying, I don't like that. I don't like how you talk to me. I don't like how you've done that. Can I show you how to do it right? Or just going, I don't need you in my life. Don't ever feel guilty about setting a boundary. Set them. If they, if they work for you, great. If you need to be flexible on it, go for it. Because there'll be some people where you're like, you just, just stay over there. And other people are like, hi, come to me. That's fine. Set your boundaries, but forgive yourself for feeling guilty. It is absolutely essential. See, she knows that's the giggle of somebody that's seen somebody at conference and went, hi, come to me. That's what that is. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> See, yes. I mean, you're pals. So, so, yes, thank you, Grant, for giving us. Anything else before we go? Hiya. The, the, it's, it's everybody. The one universal thing we all have in common, we're all going to die. Every one of us. We don't get out of this alive. So, so make the best of it. We are all going to die. Uh, and we can absolutely guarantee that. So live your best life. Pick how you want to live your best life. Make your decisions round about What's right for me? What's right for the people that I love? What's right for the things that I love and want to be around? 
And I know a lot of you are saying, it's not that easy, Kat. Can't do that because I've got responsibilities. You, that's right, you have. But you've still got decisions. You've still got choices. You can choose not to have those responsibilities. You can choose how you play those responsibilities out. You can choose to ask for help. You can choose to not ask for help. We have choices. It might look that we don't have choices, that we don't have time, that we can't forgive ourselves. We absolutely can. Saying that we can't is a defense mechanism. And that goes back to me saying, listen to your body, listen to your head and your heart, and they will tell you you have choices. So you need to start listening to yourself and taking care. For shame. Um, so shame is uh, something that comes from within and it comes from the environment. We learn about shame and there's, there's lots of really cool self-help things that you can do about shame. But again, listen to who you are. Shame is a real false negative energy. And what I would say is if you go back and listen to yourself and you have made a decision that is right for you, that is right for the people that you love and want to hold close, then you need to let shame go. If it is the right thing for you, then it's right. You should not feel shame for it. The community or the people around you might still disagree with you and try and force that on you, but that's where your boundaries come in and you, you need to say no. This is the right thing. If you truly believe in it, you'll find a way through. That's where you get your advocates. That's where you build your community and you build your support to help you. If there's something going on that means you're feeling like you're doing the wrong thing and it's making you feel shame, find an advocate and find someone to help you. Because it is not something that any of us should feel. Be yourself. Be proud of who you are. Be proud of the decisions that you've made because they're part of who you are. So shame is something that happens, but something that we can correct. Okay? Is that us? Have I talked enough, Abby? Thank you, everybody. Thank you.